we all know that almost every organization you know that's of any size in the U.S. preserves their email. I mean, that's just standard policy now. And the thing that it's taken a while to really understand is texting is really just a shorthand version of email. Why would you expect it to be any different? That's really kind of the big aha that a lot of companies are having right now is, yeah, it's just a quick steno note that reflects the tone and nature of email in an abbreviated form. Global companies face unprecedented risks and challenges in today's economy. To mitigate these legal and economic risks, companies are rapidly embracing and elevating the importance of robust ethics and compliance programs to promote positive corporate citizenship. On Corruption, Crime, and Compliance, you'll hear from industry leaders and insiders about how to create effective ethics and compliance programs that will mitigate risks and maximize financial performance. Here's your host, Michael Volkov. Well, hello, everyone. Michael Volkoff here for Corruption, Crime, and Compliance. We're here on an important episode, and I hope one that everybody gets a chance to follow up on. Eddie Green is here, the CEO of a company called Snippet Century. And the reason Eddie reached out to me and we connected with each other is, I mean, this is a hot topic. Eddie is here to talk about preserving communications data, which if you follow our blog and our work, you know, is one of our high priorities these days. Eddie, welcome so much, and thank you for taking the time to spend some time with us here on the podcast. Oh, pleasure is all mine. I appreciate the time. Eddie, give us a little bit of background as to your background in the industry, but also where you are with Snippet Century and, you know, the kind of focus you have right now, because I think that you're on the cusp of something pretty, pretty, pretty big. Sure. So my, my background... I've been doing venture capital for 28 years, done a wide range of things, anywhere from oil and gas exploration, mathematics, to cellular base station amplifiers, uh, passively Q-switch lasers. I invested in Snippet Century a couple of years ago, and it's pretty clear to me that this company has the potential to become a real unicorn. And so I was asked to take over the company and guide it through its inflection points. I have a long history of operating companies. And so I dropped into the chair about 15 months ago. And we've been busy building a texting system. It's more than that. It's a service designed to be a really easy to use service where a a user can just connect their phone and all of their texts just magically show up in the corporate archive. You don't change anything about the way that you do day-to-day operations. So, you know, your phone is probably one of the most personalized devices you own. You don't want to have to change the look and feel just because you happen to be at work or you're communicating with such and such a person. So one of our big core mandates is we don't want to change user behavior. If you like texting with iMessage, text with iMessage. They'll just show up in the archive. You want to text with WhatsApp? Go ahead. No problem. Same thing. We really look at this as building a very simple, easy-to-use SaaS service. It's what we call the three-by-three. Three Three minutes and three easy steps, and you're fully compliant, and now you've got a record that meets all of the regulatory requirements. And Eddie, you know, I'm a former federal prosecutor, so I look at what the Justice Department is doing in this area, and they've been very frustrated by large companies that come in and may be under investigation for some reason and did not preserve their text messages on WhatsApp, on Signal, on WeChat. I mean, I can go down a list, and the companies and the council have to sit there and say, well you know, we didn't have a technology to do this, or we couldn't do this, or we have an auto-delete button on WhatsApp and everything got auto-deleted. And so my question is, is Snippet Century going to get us past that sort of conversation for companies to implement and protect themselves from that type of conversation with the Justice Department? Absolutely. Look, the thing that I started life as a software engineer, and the thing that people have forgotten about is It used to be the wild frontier with email. Email was kind of a gimmick. It was for the nerds for a long time. And it was only after it went mainstream that all of a sudden it became the norm to have to preserve the record. Email archive systems have been around for 30 years now, probably longer. And that's become the the new standard. And what's happened in texting, texting is the way that people want to do business. 
you know, if you're in the finance world, you get deals done and you build relationships with business professionals that are on the move. It's no different than email. It's just the modern form of email. And so what we're saying is, look, compliance is here to stay. It's a fact. The SEC has said you will preserve all text records. It's not reasonable to say, therefore, I'm not going to text. I'd be like saying, I don't want to do email anymore. You have a business to run. You need to reach customers. Your goal is to try and grow the business. Compliance should be something that's a checklist item. You make sure you do it and you have all the processes and procedures in place, but that's not your primary goal. Your primary goal is to drive your business forward. And I want to drill down on a couple real, in terms of my technical knowledge, is not going to be anywhere near yours, but one of the concerns has been expressed with regard to ephemeral messaging. In other words, so Snapchat, whatever, you text something and then it's gone. And my question is, is this technology something that even if I'm using Snapchat, it would preserve that text message, even though if I go to the Snapchat app, wouldn't be there, correct? Or am I missing something in how you do this or how you program it? I have to be a little careful about t speaking out of school. We've never had a, a request for Snapchat, so I haven't really dug into it. My team hasn't really dug into it. Yeah. However, in the latest version of Apple with iMessage, you know, you can delete messages. So we take that into account. And I'm assuming it's probably pretty similar within Snapchat, that the fact that the phone is there and held until you're ready to view it gives us a chance to capture that message. And so even if you choose to delete it, the fact that it came to the phone means we caught it and probably have a record of it. Not probably, we do have a record of it. Yeah, so we have these situations where we start an internal investigation and what is the person, the first thing the culpable person does? They take their phone and delete all their text messages. Okay. 100%. So now what you're saying to me is the preservation of that and the access to it for the investigators is guaranteed you know, if we have snippet sentry. That's right. So we just pass those messages through and you tell us where you want to park. We don't store those messages. To us, it's data that we put down, we fully encrypt it, move it end to end, but it never stops anywhere along the way and it hits none of our servers. It's data that is only owned by the corporation and it's always stored by the corporation behind the firewall. Wow. Interesting. Another practical question is, so let's say I have a company issued phone and they're a client of yours. On that company phone would be your app or how is the system installed in the company, you know, for the company's use? Yeah. So there's a couple of things to unpack here. Let's start with, with the app. In our case, you don't need an app. That's the magic of our service. We have figured out a way that you can use your phone exactly the way you did before you engaged our service. All you have to do to start tracking iMessage is go to our website, give it your Apple ID credentials, and you're done. You don't download anything. You know, as long as the phone is always connected, you never have to revisit the website. It just magically picks up everything from that point forward, puts it into whatever corporate archive you direct it to. It's really that simple. So wait, even if I, okay, so I could, and you know, there's a distinction now in terms of how companies are treating, let's say a company owned phone versus a bring your own device phone where it's uh, a, a big issue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we've seen technical solutions where, you know, they have a policy for the BYOD device that says, if you use it for this business purpose, these documents or text messages must be preserved. So that's my question to you is company phones, it seems to me they should just be registered on the snippet entry, okay, on the website. And now the question is, what do we do with bring your own device phones in terms of preserving that? That's a great question. So I would say about 12 months ago, most of our customer inquiries were 50-50. 50% said we're going to do a corporate device. 50% said you can BYOD. Right. I would say in the last four months, it's shifted to about 85% corporate phones. That's really different. And I'll, I'll give you a, a use case here. Our investment banker is a user of our service. And he has a group of young employees. And I said, are they going to have a problem connecting up their personal phones? And he said to me, nope, I'm going to make it a company fatwa. Everybody will register their phone. And that's that. It's that simple. So I called him back to see how it was going about a week later. 
he said, not so good. All the young bucks rebelled. Nobody wants to connect up their personal phones, and it's kind of a walkaway issue for them. And I said, that's really interesting. And he said, yeah, so I reversed the policy now, and now we're going to issue corporate phones. And there are solutions out there, and some of them are very clever, but that bifurcate the traffic. But the, here's the thing you have to be careful of. Even if you say, this is my wife's number, I don't want you to track that right. message. The right. fact that they got held and then separated by software somewhere means it probably exists in the system. So if you get served with a discovery request, even though you said, I didn't want that part of the archive, if it's there in the system anywhere, you're going to have to you know, give it up for discovery. So you really haven't gotten the isolation you want. And as companies realize that, they said, okay, it's safer and better for the employees to go to corporate phones, by and large. I mean, I think that's the long-term solution because also it's just a cleaner policy and legal issue if you just say, here's our corporate phone. If you're an employee here, you use this phone for business. If you use your personal phone for business, you're not allowed to do that or whatever. But on the other hand, and companies are re-examining all of this, in term, like your investment banker friend, in terms of what are people going to do when you tell them, here's our BYOD policy, you have to register it, and you can give us the numbers or you can give us you know, whatever your personal contacts. The one thing I've also seen is a technology on phones that almost divides the phone. And says mm -hmm. this half of the phone is for personal use. These apps, that yeah, Facebook, whatever, whatever. And then this over here, when you use it, is for business, and that will be retained, and that will be stored and collected as part of the business side. And that may be a solution too as you go along. But frankly, if I tell somebody I'm hiring you, and one of our policies is you have to register your phone with Snippet Century for business purposes. You know, if you're upfront with them about it, I just think that people are going to realize, particularly in regulated industries, that they have to do this and they have to do it because everybody's in regulated industries are going to be doing this anyways, because they're under regulatory and DOJ mandates right now. And I think it, there's an educational process, I think, that you will sort of lead with company leaders and data preservation issues. You know, in terms of people responsible for that, legal people should be working closely with. Yeah, I, I, the way I think of it is, is modern email. Just, you know, just exactly, exactly. Think about the course that email took. And we all know that almost every organization, you know, that's of any size in the U.S. preserves their email. I mean, that's just standard policy now. And the thing that it's taken a while to really understand is texting is really just a shorthand version of email. Why would you expect it to be any different? That's really kind of the big aha that a lot of companies are having right now is, yeah, it's just a quick steno note that reflects the tone and nature of email in an abbreviated form. Well, and even let me also raise one other issue. You made a reference to this before in terms of like a document request in a litigation. I mean, we have the DOJ and the regulators. The SEC has collected close to over $2 billion in fines from, you know, regulated companies that didn't preserve communications. But there are also more consequences since that. Like, for example, I often talk about the Google case where the judge sanctioned Google for allowing employee chat evidence to be destroyed. And they didn't preserve it. They were under preservation order. And this was even just internal texting. Okay? Mm -hmm. Internal texting. And it wasn't preserved. And they were sanctioned. This also led to, you know inferences that it was negative information and the jury was told that. And that's the consequence. And Google, you know, had a judgment against them. This is in an antitrust case out here in California. And I'm trying to get people to think about, and I don't know what you think about this, Eddie, but to think about there are communications risks with the use of technology right now that people have to, they got to look at the risks. They, they got to develop policies and procedures to mitigate those risks. And it's not just the government, it's also civil litigation, you know, preservation, hold notices, things like that to preserve documents. When you talk to people in the business community, you know, where are people on this? Are they thinking proactively or creatively about how to address this issue? Oh, absolutely. Some of the more interesting conversations I've had with customers lately 
have been in the entertainment business. Why? Because Long there's a lot of contracts and negotiations that go on. There's a lot of intellectual property. There's a lot of things that have to be tracked. And people are they want to do business over texting because it's efficient and they can't help themselves. So what we hear consistently from movie studios is that, you know, our intellectual property is everything. We guard it very carefully in email. We monitor what's going on so that we know exactly what's being sent by whom and when. Well, that naturally gives rise to the question of, well, why aren't you doing that on text? You know, I mean, if, if an employee wants to share intellectual property information, there's nothing that prevents them from picking up his phone and just typing, them and in, typing it in and away it goes. And they're starting to really think about that. And it's being driven by the legal departments you know, across the board, not just entertainment, legal companies themselves, you know, healthcare. There's quite a number of folks that are saying, we really got to track where this is going. And if you can, you know, hopefully this never happens to snippet century, but the other issue that comes up with these sort of data preservation technologies and strategies is you are preserving a lot of data. I mean, it's a lot of data, more and more so. And people are using texting for, hey, Mike, I'll meet you in five minutes. Yeah, I'll see you there. I'll see you there. See, you, you know, it goes back and forth. Are we going to the party? Yeah, we're going to the party. But one thing that I worry about, and tell me how you handle security in terms of the last thing we ever need is a, a breach, a cyber breach of the data. And how do we protect the data? And what are you seeing in terms of best practices to sort of protect it from, you know, hackers? or anybody else getting access to all of this? Yeah, so in our service, we pass it through to whatever destination you specify. Look, it could be as simple as, I want you to send all my text messages to this email address, and it's going. my email box is going to be my depository of record. Anytime that you have a large organization where you have thousands of employees texting or sending email for that, they almost always have some form of an archive, some repository. They control that data. We don't. So our single biggest protection against the data security breach is we never hold that data. It never is at rest anywhere within our system. We only want to make sure it goes directly from the employee to the organization. We're just a conduit. That's all we are. So you're never a possible exposed link that somebody could attack because your technology is such that it goes directly right into the whatever storage capabilities. It's never at rest in your system. It's it goes right. right into the storage capabilities of the client is what you're saying. That's right. So if you attack our service, it'd be highly annoying to us. You could tear the service down. You could disrupt it for days on end. But there's not a risk at all that you're going to get any data because we simply don't have it. We have customers routinely send this data security policy questionnaires, and you know we're, we're audited, and we have all the, the certifications. We don't just say that we don't have the data. We verify and prove that we don't have the data, and we're subject to audits, and we take that very, very seriously. In working with the, and this is just an aside question, we're working with financial institutions, and I know you guys do a lot of work with the financial institutions mm -hmm. and brokers and investment advisors or whatever, but... Are you finding that they are getting more sophisticated in this area and are they starting to store their data more in the cloud and off premises and things like that so that it's even you know more secure in that sense? Absolutely. Look, the biggest financial firms, you know, have security yeah. off. And it's for good reason. They understand that data breach damages their franchise and they're very, very careful. That's probably one of the most important jobs in company these days, no more than anywhere else than in the finance business. People really protect what's going on. And so the level of sophistication, the thoroughness of whether they're examining us or other components in the whole system, they are very rigorous and very thoughtful about how it works by and large. And that's almost without exception. They've given us a lot of good insight as to how should we think about various use cases and you know, what do we do in the following circumstances? It's been a very productive two-way conversation. Well, my hope, Eddie, is that not only are you, you know, we're going to try to get this message out from you, which is it's not only important to talk to the chief information security officer and, you know, work with the CISOs and the technical people, but we want to get you in touch with compliance people. Because they're playing a bigger and bigger role with IT and with the information security people in terms of 
training people on best practices, how to avoid breaches. Now they have a mandate to preserve communications and they're asking us, well, we need to put a policy together on how are we going to do this, update our document retention program. So I'm hoping that, you know, this can lead to more contact and more education from you and your company to people in the compliance arena who already are working closer. One of the biggest developments last year in the compliance space was more and more partnerships between compliance and IT and chief information security officers because of data privacy and other issues. And I hope that this leads to sort of more compliance sort of, you know, partnerships for you, because I think that's important. And what do you think in terms of the role of compliance here, in terms of them being a natural partner for you? Oh, 100%. So in the finance world, about 80% of the market is in the low end of the business, meaning that they're small firms with a lot of assets under management, the RIAs of the world. They typically don't have in-house IT. They don't have in-house compliance. They work with big compliance platforms. You know, our vision is you ought to be able to come in, look at testimonials on our website, sign up for an account, put in your credit card, connect your phone, you're done. Mm. And now what's happening is all that information is being funneled to your compliance platform just as the email is. It's no different. And so the same compliance people that are monitoring all your email transactions now are just looking at your texts and saying, yep, everything's covered. And that's where we're heading. We want to make it that simple and that ubiquitous that it's literally three minutes and three steps and you're done. And our big aim right now is, you know, we're just about to launch a massive campaign for RIAs. And we've done a lot of conversations with folks, a lot of conversations with RIA platforms. And, and the demand is there because There's no question as the SEC extends the rules and the regulations, they're moving down in the market and it's happening pretty quickly. And just to make your life a little bit more hectic, I think you're going to hear from healthcare companies. You're going to hear from manufacturing companies. All of our, like our clients are not just in the financial industry. We have some and they're all asking these same questions, Eddie. So my, my hope is that they come to you guys and you guys can give them the 333 solution. And off they go because they're scratching their heads and wondering, how do they do this? What should they do? You know, Eddie, let me thank you so much for spending time with us. Most importantly, if people want to get in touch with you and your company, what's the best way to reach you and the company and and your company's website as well? Sure. So the company website is www.snippetcentury.com, S-N-I-P-P-E-T. S-E-N-T-R-Y dot com. And I could be reached directly at eddie dot green, green like color at snippetcentury.com. Fantastic. Eddie, thank you again. Thanks for the work that you're doing. All the great success to your company. And we really appreciate your, you know, connecting with us. And, you know, maybe within like a year, I'd like to have you come back and sort of give us a report on where we are and what we still need to do. In this I would love that. Yeah, well, I think that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Thanks again, Thank Eddie. You okay. The time. I appreciate it. If you enjoyed this episode, the best way to support the show is by subscribing on your favorite listening platform. To learn more and connect with Michael Volkov, go to volkovlaw.com. 